This message is part of the teaching provided by House on the Rock Fellowship, a church caring for the Miami Valley region. Before you listen, be sure to access the notes in the download section of the message page. Have a Bible ready. Thank you for being our guest. You pray me through this and and we'll do this together. Last week we started a new series, Jesus MD, Letting God Heal Us. And what does that mean as, as we hear that message that God is our healer? If you weren't able to be with us last week, I encourage you, go online and, and you can get caught up. Uh, we said that God offers universal access to actual health care. In culture and in politics, uh, everyone's talking about sick care and how to afford sick care. And is sick care, or I say sick care because that's what it is. It's sick management. It's not really health care. You can pay for it. It's no guarantee of health. You go to the doctor, it's no guarantee of health. Is it a right? Should you have it? Shouldn't you have it? Should the government be in charge of it? Big conversations across the board. It's been that way for about 10, 12 years now. But we pull back and say, well, what does the Bible actually say? What father does not love to give good gifts to the one who asks? That's our God. And doesn't that apply to health? Our physical well-being. So we're going to move through this idea for the next, you know, six weeks, seven weeks. So again, if you weren't able to be with us, uh, go back and get caught up. We're going to start drilling down on that idea uh, this week. To help us do that, uh, let's launch into this time with the words of the Lord's Prayer, the Jesus Prayer in the back of our minds. Those are in your notes, in the middle section of your notes. If you could open them up just so you could see them. I want to walk you through that just as a guide to prepare hearts and minds and, and, and to keep moving forward what Aaron has already said. And if you grew up praying the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, it goes by lots of different names. We tweak the words a little bit just so we don't get rote, start cranking out words that we don't think about don't really understand or don't really care about. But when Jesus was asking, you know, teach us to pray, he says, hey, when you pray, these are words. These are good words. These are the right words. Our Father in heaven. You're in your space. We're down here in our space. Be glorified in our lives. That's what it means, be hallowed. Be glorified in what's going on here this morning. Your kingdom come, your will be done here, here, just like it is there where you are. Give us daily needs, what we need today. Maybe you've come in with concerns and fears and worries and doubts, questions, frustrations. God, would you meet us in those daily needs? Forgive us our debts as we forgive those. In fact, that's something that God really takes very seriously. If you're not going to practice forgiveness in your life, why should I practice forgiveness in your life? Guide us through all of our trials, hardships, difficulties. Rescue us from the evil. And let that kind of jettison us into our discussion this morning. So with this in front of you, pray this with me. From here. Not from here. Let's do it from here. Out loud together. Our Father in heaven, be glorified in our lives. Your kingdom come and will be done here as it is in heaven. Give us our daily needs. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Guide us through our trials and rescue us from evil. Amen. Amen. It says this in Exodus 15 verse 26. Just listen. It says this. If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes, give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the disease on you that I put on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord, your healer. For I am the Lord, your healer. The Lord who heals. That means to make whole. To mend something. To stitch it back together again. To repair it. God says, that's what I do. 
in a world saturated with brokenness and death and disease, in a world where relationships are fractured and bodies are fractured and minds are fractured, I'm the Lord who puts you back together again. Anyone, and Aaron has given us a good example this morning, anyone kind of just struggle with that a little bit? This morning, like, I don't quite know what that means. Like, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. Like, I like keeping God in the God space on Sunday morning, but is he gonna start poking around my life and putting things where, like, I kind of like being messed up. And if God starts pushing pieces around, like, I'm not gonna start falling on the ground and doing weird things, am I? What does it mean when you say, I am the God who heals? Some of us have been programmed to resist that idea. We need God to heal us from that. If God says, you can know me as the God who puts you back together again, and we send something inside of us that pushes against that, then we need God to heal us of that very thing this morning. I think a little contact tracing may help us do that. I didn't even know what contact tracing was a year ago. Did any of you like contact tracing? What's that? Like, you know, we're going to plot out, I got sick and I got it from this person and then this, this person. I talked to you and I talked to you and this is how it's moving. There's entire departments, there's entire government agencies now that are devoted to this very complex notion of contact tracing. Truth be told, it's really helpful when it comes to what we believe and what we don't believe. Because a far more dangerous than a virus is a really bad idea. A really bad idea is deadly. Really bad ideas are incredibly, incredibly contagious, divisive, they destroy. Churches have been laid waste because of a bad idea. Faiths have been shipwrecked because of a bad idea. Relationships have fallen off the mark because of a bad idea. And I think there's a few bad ideas that might be in play in our hearts and our minds as we approach the notion that God actually wants to heal us and put us back together again. Because when you have a virus, you feel sick, right? I had COVID, not fun. Anyone here had COVID and say, that was awesome, let's do it again. Like, that was a blast. Holy cow, that was terrible. When you have a virus, you feel sick. When you have a bad idea, you feel right. You feel right, and that's dangerous. So if you would indulge, I want to do a little contact tracing when it comes to some of the ideas that have wiggled its way maybe into your way of seeing things and I know have wiggled into my way of understanding and seeing things over the years. So I need four helpers. I promise it's not embarrassing. All you got to do is hold a whiteboard. It's not going to be anything weird. I've done some weird stuff to volunteers in the past. You guys are safe this week. I just need four. Come on down and we'll give you like, think just four of you. Get, yeah, you can help. Absolutely. Absolutely. By all means. Yep, one, two, yep, come on, David, yep, yep. Here she comes. Zanesville's coming to town. Woo, yeah. This is awesome. I need one more. One more. Come on up, yep. I'm going to stand right here in the middle. I need one more. This is Zanesville right here. This is Aaron Brooks' mom. Yeah, thank you so much. Here you go, Dave. Oh, yeah, that's good. Mama Goss. I knew it. I knew it. Oh, there you go. I don't know how that goes. Right there, please. And could all, all four of you just take one step back because in my girth, I kind of get in the way. Oh, I love you. All right, so you're a nurse, aren't you? No, oh, this would be awesome. You're going to help us with this, this, this medical thing. Okay, so do you see an eraser over there? Could I have that eraser? This is going to be helpful to me. So if we go back about, uh, can you hold that up there for me? Can you do that? Yeah, just per- a little bit lower. And it's actually Aiden's body that I traced on there, so it might not fit you, but yeah, it works. It works. So if we go back about 200 years before the New Testament, okay, 200 years before Jesus, a guy named Plato shows up. And Plato has this great notion. He says, you know what? As I look at man, man is really body 
and spirit. He split. I see the body and I see the spirit. And what we really need to figure out how to do is kind of get that spirit free of the body. Because the body's a nuisance. And this is what we call dualism. And I wish I could find out with catchy ideas and notions. You're doing rock solid, man. But, but write that down, dualism. And dualism is this notion that this is split. And we got body on one side and spirit. Okay, write that down. It's not whole. We're, we're different components. And if we could really figure out how to kind of be free of the body, then the spirit could become everything that it's supposed to become. Now that sounds good, right? I mean, that's, yeah, I can feel that. I know I got a body, but I know I have a spirit. And the spirit, it's, it's already at play. It's already at play. What happened then, thank you, we're going to move forward in time. Ready, chief? We're going to, yeah. That's good. That's good. The early church fathers kind of really landed in this notion that, you know what, you're right. There is a difference between body and spirit. In the body, it's bad. It's bad. It leads me to do bad things. It makes me want to drink. And it makes me want to, I'll get out of the way, Mom, so you can take a good picture. Okay? It yearns for things and it desires things. So it's not just that the body's on one side and the spirit's on the other. The body is bad. And so they would go off to the desert and they'd hide among the hills and they'd wear painful fabrics and cloths and they'd starve themselves and they'd whip themselves and they'd cut themselves and they'd destroy the flesh. Because after all, Paul said the flesh is evil. in attempts to get their spirit closer to God. Spirit, we want to raise up. Flesh is bad. We need to control it. We need to separate it. We need to punish it. Well, time moves forward. Uh, in, in your notes, we wrote down dualism. Mortify is the big word. Mortify. To kill. To slay. And this might be in the back of your mind a little bit. You know, the body just gets me in trouble. It's bad. Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Weak and evil are not the same thing. It's just weak. It's weak. But you move in time. We come into what we call the dark ages, the middle ages. Not a great time for the church. For the Western church, actually a very bad time. A lot of corruption Selling of indulgences, reliquaries. Hey, come, this is the actual cross of Jesus. Give us money and we'll let you touch it. Fake miracles. And some theologians and thinkers are saying, man, there's something wrong in the church. We need to restore, fix, push away from, resist that. Because after all, isn't following Jesus an act of faith? That's a good thing, right? Following Jesus, is that faith? Faith alone, right? Right? Yep, faith alone. And since following Jesus is about faith, I'm pretty sure all that visual stuff is not from God. The Holy Spirit has probably ceased doing those things because following Jesus is about faith. God might have done that stuff in the past, and it was probably very helpful for the apostles to get the ball rolling, but since the ball's rolling now, following Jesus is about faith, and things like healing, manifestations of the Spirit, those have ceased. We call that cessationism. I know that's a complicated, there's no better, that's what it's actually called. Cessationism. This has ceased. And there's a big, hold on to it, you ready? You holding it? You're doing a great job. Big barrier now. With the Spirit, it's not going to cross over to help the body. We don't do that. We don't need that. We shouldn't want it. Because if we're really following Jesus, that's just faith. You don't see this much in Orthodox churches. You don't see this much in, in, in Roman churches. They are much more sensitive to the miraculous. Western Protestant expressions of the church, this is very common. And maybe you've come from that culture, and you're absolutely right now, you are freaking out because I'm poking at something. Cessation is a big umbrella. A lot of things fall under it. And there can be a lot of demonstrations of it. 
theologians that you respect, pastors that, that you admire, denominations that you've come from. You might have that in the background. They might put it in the foreground. Like if you're following Jesus by faith and you don't need, you don't need things like healing. It's kind of weird. But maybe it's there. Maybe it's there. I come from that tradition, experience that tradition. It's, that's, you know, I struggle with that. We're going to jump to the Bible in a little bit and see what it says. But what was very destructive and has been very destructive, so if we move forward a little bit more, all right, Mama Goss, you got that? Yeah, hold it straight up front and work. There you go. Yep, just like practice CrossFit. You got it, girl. <laughs> the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment. Write that down. The age of science. The age of reason. The age of everything is supposed to make sense. If it's real, we can measure it, we can quantify it, we can label it, we can categorize it. Sure, you could believe in God if you really think you need to, but to be perfectly honest, that doesn't belong anywhere. You ready? That doesn't belong anywhere on the table at all. That's a Sunday morning expression. That's a Sunday morning thing. Faith, that's just between you and yourself. It's really just about the body. I don't think we really understand the depth to which this has worked its way into how we approach the world. Keep the spirit to me. But really it's all about the physical, the touchable, the body that's for doctors with degrees who can explain it, who can quantify it. And there's really no place for the miraculous. Any of those ideas sound a little familiar to you? You've experienced that. You've thought that. All these things are at play. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. All these things are at play. Did a great job. Babe. Right there, man. Lance Buster Rock, man. That was good. Oh, he, he actually did it. Zanesville, thank you for coming up. The notion that we are split and we are body and spirit, and really the body's quite bad. In fact, if your body could suffer, you'll probably get closer to Jesus that way because that's what suffering's for. Suffering is to bring you closer to Jesus. Now, does God leverage suffering? Uh-huh. But we can take that to an extreme. That the Holy Spirit has stopped doing things. Listen, just listen to me. If God did it to someone, God can do it for you. If God did it then, God can do it now. He's God. And it's dangerous for us to say, yeah, but he fits in this box. I'm not touching that box. But like I said, what's very dangerous is how we play to the notion that everything is rational, everything um, is neat. Have any of you guys figured out following Jesus can be messy? God is a surprising God, a living, active person who likes to go, ha ha, didn't see that one, did you? A celebration, a relationship. All of these things are at play. And so if you can kind of say, how did I get to this place where I even hear in the Bible, God heals me, I'm like, ooh, ooh, ah, ah. Nah, don't touch. Theologically, how did we get to this place? You start to work yourself back into time and you can see all of these things working its way into the church. So much so, kind of like Mark 13, where Jesus is in Nazareth. And it says, he could not do mighty works. Why? Because of their lack of faith. Yeah, I don't know what that means. I mean, if I just take it at face value... Is it possible that the Spirit won't do stuff in the church because of our lack of faith, or un understanding, a lack of understanding? I don't know. I don't know. 
So let's figure out how, how, do we, how do we skip over all of that? How do we skip over these ideas that have worked their way into the church? Okay, so let's skip 2,200 years, 2,300 years back in history. How did a Hebrew view themselves? How did she understand herself? How did he understand himself? Okay, diagnostically, write this down in your notes. God creates whole souls. This is where it starts. The beginning. God creates whole souls souls. If you're following online, write that down somewhere. Whole souls. Genesis 2-7. The beginning of the book. The Lord God farmed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. The word living creature is the word for soul. Nefesh. Soul. You are a soul. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. You have a spirit. You have an arm. You have a brain. You have a mind. You are a soul. Don't break apart what God has put together. Three times a day, a a devout Israelite would pray the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, strength. Break that down. Heart, inside parts. That's what that word means. Soul, whole thing. Strength, body. Three times a day, a faithful Israelite was to recalibrate himself, herself to understand, I follow God with the whole thing. I'm to love God with the whole thing. All my time, all my emotion, all my facets, all of me. Loving God is a soul practice. And God made me holistically that way. Does God delight in his creation? Like, does he enjoy it? Does he look upon all that he has made? Does the the lilacs that are starting to open up in our backyard? My wife loves lilacs. She just, it's, it's just the most beautiful thing in the world. My wife stands in front of this lilac, but she's just, and I'm like, oh, she's beautiful. Does my God delight in, my wife delighting in the lilacs that he created? Does he? Okay, okay. Does he delight in? The colors that painted the sky this morning as the sun came up. Does he like, <laughs> I'm good. Does he delight in us delighting in that? What he has created. Yeah. Does he delight in the flavor of fruits and vegetables? as an aspect of what he has created. I know we're now in a debate, well, maybe not this vegetable or that vegetable. Those vegetables came after the fall. Lima beans, definitely post-fall. But does God delight in that that has flavor and that has texture, that has nutrient, that has value, that has goodness? I I think he does. I I think he does. So let me ask, does God delight in my body? Maybe not what I've done to it. I'm working on it. Does God delight in the body? Yeah, I started to reflect on and think on, are there things explicitly about my body, about your body, that might lead one to conclude that God cares for the body? How about an immune system? Did God gift and design the body to have an immune system where it can, check this out, it can, by its own programming, recognize, repel, and deal with infections and bacteria and viruses. Is that not cool? I mean, that's incredible. That's amazing. God gave it a self-protection mechanism. That's, That's awesome. That's awesome. If God didn't care about the body, would he do that? Would he do that? Like, God, I hate that body. Now it can take care of itself. How about the nervous system? 
the nervous system. Aiden experienced the nervous system late last late night when his toe met the door jam on his way to the bathroom. Okay, I come out and he's like, just dang, what happened? Man? I grabbed my toe into the door jam and it hurts now. Right? How many of you have done that? Are you not thankful? And this is odd, but it's a great story. Are you not thankful that your body communicated with your head, we've got a problem, we've got a man down? As opposed to just walking, Aiden walking all over the house, gushing blood from his toe, all over his mom's new carpet, and then she'd kill him. But, but he's, he's, he recognized his body was able to communicate with the head that, hey, we need attention, we need to take care of something. There's something wrong with a part of us. That's, that's part of God's creation and God's design. Is that not beautiful? Isn't that amazing how he created it? He created it that way. To recognize when something's wrong. But also to experience beauty and good. Things taste good. You didn't have to do that. He wanted to do that. That tastes good. Paul, you take that, and you put a little olive oil on that, Paul, and you put a little salt and pepper on that, and you put that on the grill, and I tell you what, man, I did that. I'm like, God, thank you. That's awesome. I'm like, before, I, before I eat, I'm like, God, thank you for this. This tastes good. And it just tastes good. It actually provides resources for my body to be healthy, to prosper. God designed it that way. Oh, that smells good. I walk outside in the back where the lilac bush are. I'm like, that smells good. That feels good. That tastes good. That looks good. Sound. Oh, my goodness. Sound. God, thank you for the way that sounds. I was listening to a recording of, of the Navy Choir. They were, uh, they were singing the opening, opening to the Lion King, which I thought was kind of interesting. This woman goes, she just starts belting it out, right? You ever heard the Lion King? She belts it, ah! and she's like, she's doing it like, oh my goodness, holy cow! And then the choir's in the back, no, 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 no. Then I'm like, I just start, doing, I want to go conquer something, I want to go do something, because these sounds have just captivated my very being, the sound of it. God, you, you, you did that. You, you created that so it, can, it touches me and it moves me. Thank you. Jackson uh, really likes The Greatest Showman. It's a good musical. Good songs, good songs. And there's this, there's this anthem, this ballad that this, this soprano sings right in the middle of it. She's just standing on stage. She's belting this thing out there. And I'm like, whoa. The words and the notes and the melody, it just... It wakens up my soul. I was driving back from a soccer game and I, I drove past another car and I saw one passenger signing to another one. Number one, that's beautiful. It's amazing that you know, one sense you know, was compromised, but they were able to communicate in another way. I'm like, oh God, thank you that I can hear. Might we conclude just, just, Upon reflection, that God cares about, delights in my body. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. But what's happened? What's happened? In your notes, we've corrupted the whole soul. God created it, we corrupted it. The whole thing. Many years ago, I was driving to pick up the boys uh, from the house that they were staying at after work. I was driving and I was having a phone call with my wife and she was very frustrated, upset. Tears were, were streaming down. I could hear her doing the <laughs> through the phone because her boss told her that the paychecks weren't going to clear this week. She's working for a clinic and there were some financial problems. Maybe you've experienced that. Paychecks aren't clearing this week. 
she was upset, I was getting angry. The more she got upset, the more angry I got, which meant... <laughs> flattening the hills of greater Pennsylvania, hitting those curves. Me and Bo Luke do <laughs> my Malibu Max. It was raining. I was flying until I was actually flying because I hit one curve and the, we went up and we were gone and we were flying and soaring and hydroplaning and wrecked the car on the side of the road. Airbags went off. <laughs> yeah, that hurts. Oh, that hurts. Tow truck comes, they transport the car to the place where they fix the cars, have to wait for the insurance person to come by. Yes, Mr. Hickernell, your car has been totaled. Like, I was there. Like when I hear totaled, I think totaled, like that crusher that they have at the place where they crush the cars and it comes out like a little box. In my mind, that's a total. That's totaled. You're not doing anything with that. That's a, that's a paperweight. Like that's total. Like the airbag, the airbag went off and that's, it's just easier for us if we just total it out. Like really? Really? Like yeah. Yeah. It's not totaled, but it's totaled. Okay. You? Me, we are totaled. Like the whole thing is corrupted. The whole soul has been corrupted. And you might experience it physically and mentally and emotionally and socially, relationally, spiritually. You will experience it in all of those shapes and sizes. But we have to be okay and embrace the realization that the whole thing has been wrecked. A key verse in developing a healthy biblical theology uh, of healing and God's care for us physically is in Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 5. I want you to look at that one. We're going to look at it together. Isaiah 53, 4 through 5. Isaiah is right in the middle uh, of the book, so normally if you just open it up right to the middle, you normally land around Isaiah and find 53. That's a big 5-3. You want to find a little four and a little five. Nikki's going to bring them up on the screen. Isaiah 53, four through five. Let me read for you. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Maybe some of you recognize that passage. Okay? But let me, let me draw your attention to s some important themes here. Okay? Surely he's borne our griefs. Maybe your translation says diseases. That's a good word, disease. Grief is referring to physical pains and physical limitations, infirmities, things that affect the body. That's what that word means. Not just griefs, I'm sad, but no, 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 no. It's, it's griefs, my body is hurting, my body is injured. He's borne those. Carried our sorrows. Now we're talking about sadness. We're talking about the things that depress me and make me anxious, the things that I'm fearful, the emotional, internal things, since he's carried those. Verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Transgressions, those things that I have done th that fracture and break relationship with God, that corrupt that relationship with God. And the iniquities, meaning the consequences that come along with that. But he gives me peace. And by what he has endured, I'm put back together again. I'm healed. I'm healed. It's that same word when it says God is our healer. In Exodus, it's the same word here. He heals. He puts it back together. What is he putting back together? So what's been described in that passage? Uh, physical problems, right? Emotional problems, right? Spiritual problems, yeah. Yep, why? Because the whole thing's been corrupted. The whole thing's broken. The whole thing's jacked up by sin and death. And so God heals and is healing the whole thing. Because of his work, there's peace. The whole package. And what's been done is ours. It's our pain. It's our sorrow. It's our transgression. It's our infirmity. Okay. 
He doesn't leave us in that, does he? What's the promise of that passage? This comes in, in, in what's called um, the suffering servant songs and laments in, in Isaiah. And it talks about uh, the anticipation of one who is going to make this right. An anointed one, a, a Messiah. Because of our challenges, because of our corruption, because of our depravity, because of our woundedness. One must come who will make it right. So in your notes, God offers a cure for the whole soul. God offers a cure for the whole soul. He has borne, he has carried, he was crushed, he was pierced. With his wounds, we are healed. And the temptation is, well, that means spiritually. Uh, do you see what you just did? You see what you just did? You broke apart what God's putting together. God cares for the whole soul. Why did you break it apart? That passage itself talks about physical and spiritual and emotional. Why did you break it apart? Why are you interpreting it in a way that wasn't written? He puts it back together again. He, he brings a, a cure for the whole thing. Then why did he die from cancer? Why does she have to carry that? Why does this hurt? Are those fair questions? Yeah, those are fair questions. Those are real fair questions. Let me ask another question. Don't raise your hand. Mentally raise your hand. How many of you are saved? How many of you screwed up this week? See that? How many of you are saved? I saved. Saved, signed, sealed, and delivered. Hallelujah. How many of you screwed up this week? Yeah. Is God in the process of saving you? Yeah. Is God in the process of healing you? Yeah. Yeah. We are caught in the between of now and not yet. And there are times and there are ways where God surges Jesus' life into my spirit and heals. And there are times when God surges into my body and heals. And there are times when God surges into my emotional brokenness and he heals. But we are caught between the now and the not yet. And there is a time coming and will come where the great physician will remove all of sin and death. And we get a new body, dude. Oh, I can't wait. This one's not working as well as it used to. In Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5, I thought maybe we could read this together. Did you read this with me? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Those are good words. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. The whole thing, the whole thing, my whole soul. And don't you dare forget all of his benefits. Who forgives iniquities, praise God, and heals diseases. Renews my strength so I can rise up like eagles. Maybe that's a psalm to meditate on if this is something that pokes a little close to your theology. What do you, what do you prescribe, Paul? What, what are you asking of me this morning? 
It's the same thing I said last week, and it's been on the title screen the whole time. Let God heal you. Let God heal you. Let him heal you. Come to the great physician. Humble yourself. If you really believe it's good news, then it should be good. What father does not love to give good gifts to the child he loves? The child who asks. The child who seeks. There's a story in Numbers 21. I'd like to read it for you. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. It's part of Israel's wandering experience. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. Are we there yet? 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 And the people spoke against God and spoke Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food. There's no water. And we loathe this worthless food. A bunch of toddlers. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. That's like real extreme parenting. Many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. It's interesting. Spiritual problem manifests itself physically. Moses prayed to the people. Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So if I were to imagine, if you imagine with me, if we were to draw what he built, it would probably look something like this, right? It's a serpent on a pole, right? You've probably seen it like this. Or maybe if you went to the hospital and you met a caregiver, a nurse, she was wearing a pin that looked like this. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So my question is, if we don't have a problem running to that, why can't we learn to run to that? Some of you are learning to ask. You've been sending me connection cards and prayer requests. Pastor Paul, will you pray for my depression? Pastor Paul, will you pray for my anxiety? Pastor Paul, will you pray for my, my shoulder that needs to heal? Pastor Paul, will you pray for my marriage? Pastor Paul, will you pray for my sleepless nights? Some of you are experiencing God's healing or have experienced healing and you've told me, you filled out the, those testimony cards in your notes and I encourage you to do that. Pastor Paul, this, I've gone through cancer multiple times. And God has healed me. Pastor Paul, I went through intense chemo and I never felt any pain. Pastor Paul, I remember when I was a child and God miraculously healed a hand wound that I had. And please send in those stories. Keep bringing in those stories. I want to keep sharing those stories. Pastor Paul, God healed my relationship with my mom. Pastor Paul, God has done this. God put the pieces back together again. And why shouldn't he? For I'm the Lord your God. I'm the one who heals you. Thank you for sharing your time with us. And we'd love for the journey to continue. If you're a guest, would you consider reaching out to us? We would love to come alongside and encourage you in any way that we can. If you're someone who's joined us today and you are desperately reaching to find hope wherever you can, again, Jesus came that we would find hope. You can find hope today. If you want to send us a short note, a member of our hope team would reach out quickly, promptly to come alongside and see what we can do to encourage you in whatever storm you might find yourself in. That's why Jesus came. And that's why we're here. Jesus said there's two ways to live your life. And a wise man, a wise woman, builds their life on Jesus' instructions. God bless.